No, so um, no, I just think that that's uh, pretty cool. So uh, is there anybody here who is familiar with who I am at all? Anybody? Show well, that's super flattering, so thank you. Um, I'm gonna be talking about building your personal brand from scratch because more than anything, I think that what I like about uh, what Chris is doing with this event and uh, what Adobe is doing is, I think that people need to appreciate and respect the journey of a creator. And I think that what we all are making is something that is very personal to us. Does, does anybody feel that way, show of hands? that like what they do is very personal to them and it's what they're excited about, what they're passionate about, what they feel that they're good at, makes them feel good about themselves and a sense of purpose and confidence. I really believe in that and I believe in creators. I think it's literally never been a better time to be a creator. I think that everyone has this uh, belief that if you didn't uh, start the day that a new platform came out and jump on it and ride the wave, that maybe it's game over or what have you, or even if you've been doing it for the past 20 years that like, you know, you never know when that new renaissance is gonna come and something's gonna inspire and invigorate you and you're gonna get an opportunity to pivot. And I think that an important part of that is understanding your personal brand and what matters to you, what's meaningful to you, and how you relate and connect to other people, but also how do you leverage that and how do you monetize that effectively and how do you put together a great strategy for communicating your value and what you care about and what you're doing. So we're gonna do that and uh, I've got a little bit of a session breakdown for you. Uh, we're gonna go through a little brief introduction. We won't spend very long on it because you guys apparently know who I am, which again, super flattering, so thank you for that. Uh, we're gonna talk about what's your story and I'm gonna frame for you how you present that. I'm going to explain that uh, when you're building your personal brand, this is gonna end up being a rant. You might have seen this rant from me once or twice, but it's like, I'm gonna explain that yeah, Duh, you're not a bottled water. It's not about being inauthentic and it's not about packaging yourself and all that other crap and shameless self-promotion that everybody wants to talk you out of building your brand is gonna throw at you. Everybody's gonna give you that same overheard about don't be a Kardashian, hun. And I'm gonna literally uh, walk you through why that's nonsense and kind of throw that back at people and help you understand how you build your brand authentically uh, since they wanna think that um, you're fake, which is, I think that's really hypocritical for anybody uh, with a pedigree to tell you that somehow they're more authentic than you. I think that that's nonsense. And uh, again, I'll save that rant for later. <laughs> but we're gonna talk about building credibility in your niche. We're gonna talk about understanding content strategy. That's a lot of the new material that I haven't presented before is I'm gonna go granular on context of platform and a few other things that uh, you may not have heard. And I'm gonna talk about strategies that connect and I'm gonna talk about community building and I'm actually gonna give you guys things that you can do when you walk out of here. So is anybody excited about that? Ooh, woo. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. All right, so who am I? What's my story? Some of you, uh, you might be familiar with me from YouTube. Um, I've produced over a thousand videos on YouTube alone. Uh, I did most of that completely solo, um, sometimes getting the occasional help or collab. And, uh, it grew my community to over a quarter million subscribers over the last four years, which is awesome. I didn't know that that many people cared about the same things that I cared about. So that's pretty cool to be a part of, of that bigger community and to be able to bring together people around things that we like. Um, I also have done a thousand live streams across all the platforms because this isn't about YouTube, like I said. This is about you. This is about where do you produce content? What's your bigger overall game plan? And not being beholden to a single platform. So I dabbled in all the live stream platforms, everything from Facebook Live to Twitch, Early Adopter Periscope, Rest in Peace Meerkat, Rest in Peace Blab, like, and so many other platforms that we've had to bury. Um, so, I, you know, I've for lack of a better term, seen it all, done it all. Um, for the last two years, my content has allowed me the opportunity to do public speaking and interact and learn more from p all of you and to be able to engage with you and figure out how I can better help you with resources and information or advice or just listening or having a sounding board. And it's given me the opportunity to work with great brands like Adobe, like HP, like Dell, like Samsung, um, and many others. So. There's a lot that building your personal brand, creating content around things you love, putting yourself out there can do for you in terms of providing value. But equally importantly, if not more importantly, it brings you the relationships that you probably want the most. We live in this wonderful age 
of digital and the internet where we're no longer limited by the fact that if we're born in a small town or born on the other side of the world that we're limited in our relationships and we get to always feel like we're on the island of misfit toys. We don't have to feel that way anymore. We actually can bring the relationships to us that we actually want around similar interest and have community and we're not bound by geography anymore. We can actually hang out with human beings that we like instead of painting on smiles and pretending to get along, to go on and on and so on and so forth and everything like that. And we can actually spend more time on the things we actually give a crap about instead of pretending to like things that we really can't stand and people that we can't stand. So guess what? This lets you be authentic. Your content will bring you the community that you've always wanted to be a part of if you are doing the things that you love. And you can make it practical. It can be a real business and it can give you more opportunities than you've ever imagined. So what is your personal brand? What is your story? Who are you? Why does it matter? You know, I became a creative entrepreneur because I grew up my whole life in a family of creative people. I grew up in a family of artists and photographers that worked a nine to five job and lived for their nights and weekends and had to scrounge up time to do the things that they love in a very limited fashion and capacity. And they never were able to ever go full time on it. And watching that was the most depressing, disheartening, devastating experience. And I was determined to not have that be my life. I was determined to make it and be a creator and do what I love and do it for a nine to five job. And I did that. And I went to corporate America and I did that. And it sucked. And it made me depressed. And it made me, uh, it took my anxiety through the roof. It literally had me wanting to throw myself in front of the number two train. And I'm not even exaggerating that one. But guess what? The beauty of the world we live in tonight, today and why I think it's never been a better time to be a creator is I had an out. I had an option. And for me that meant embracing the thing that I thought I had to earn 20 years later is the right to be an entrepreneur. And the beauty of it is that every single person in this room can go directly to the marketplace, be competitive, offer the value that they have beating in their chest and find people who actually care about it and not be beholden to a gatekeeper or to somebody who is a czar of taste to tell you no. Andy Weir, the guy who wrote The Martian, every single publishing company told him no. He went directly to market in Amazon and iBooks, was practically an overnight bestseller and everyone who shut him down, all these czars of Tice who decided that they know what we will and won't read and what we won't care about were proven wrong outrightly by us as consumers, as the market and everyone here has that same opportunity. And now we know who Andy Weir is because now we have The Martian, a, you know, award winning film that they buy, bought the rights to from the book with uh, leading man Matt Damon and everything like that. Oh on a book that the czars of taste, the gatekeepers, said nobody would ever read and that they told Andy he wasted two years of research in writing this. So the story of Andy Weir comes from a place that I think is the same story as many of you. It's the same story of me. Being dissatisfied with the way things are and then taking meaningful action to bring to life and to create the value in the things that you want to see in the world. In other words, the thing I say in my videos, create something awesome today and share it with the world. Take the thing beating in your chest, take the thing in your brain that won't go away and bring it out here to life using the tools and resources available to you. And again, I'm gonna repeat it. Because of the resources we have, because of the tools we have, because of the platforms we have, it's never been a better time to be a creator. So how do you find out what you care about, what your niche is, what you're going to do, how you're going to create content, where you're going to go. I, got, I came up with a list of a very, a very important questions that I think come down to how you become more self-aware because you're going to hear a lot of people probably over the next decade preach the gospel of self-awareness and I'll be right there on the front lines with them because I think if you know who you are, what drives you, what makes you tick, what makes you happy, what makes you sad, if you really understand that, and then you understand what actions you can deploy against that to get the net result that you want, you have a better shot of winning. And so I came up with a list of questions. I came up with what is it that you really are good at? What do you have a skill at? What are you talented at? What gets you excited? What makes you, what, like, if I were going to talk about something that excites me that isn't creativity, what I could do is I could clear my schedule and I could sit down with Chris and I could talk about Star Wars for the next eight hours without stopping. <laughs> and if I were really smart, I would just record the entire thing and then outsource the editing. 
right? <laughs> so I could do that. If I really want to talk about something that I'm excited about beyond content creation, I could pull my friend Andrew Edwards aside and we could sit there and I could literally just rip apart everything that I think sucks about the iPhone 10. And if I was really smart, I'd hit record and I'd monetize the heck out of it. So again, I think that knowing what you're excited about, what gets you fired up, what is it that you don't like? What do you want to change in the world? What if you could, if, there was a, if there's a problem in the world, if there's something you don't like and you want to punch it in the face, you can turn on the record button and you can do that. Casey Neistat's success and rise to fame mostly comes off of the videos that he created as a filmmaker, short videos about things that he was ticked off about. Like when he did before YouTube existed, iPhone's dirty, uh, sorry not iPhone, iPod's dirty little secret. Sorry Apple, it looks like I'm leaning into you today, I apologize. Um, and I'm doing that while like doing my presentation on the new MacBook Pro. <laughs> So, <laughs> irony. But Casey Neistat was mad about the iPod battery life issue and at the time their policy was buy another $400 iPod. And this was back in the day when $400 was a lot more money than it currently is now. I still think that's a lot of money just to listen to music, but you know, that's me. Um, so, he did this video and it blew up. And ironically, uh, the hosting fees were ridiculous until he realized that Apple had a free service at the time. He just started hosting a video, ripping them apart on their own platform, which is hilarious. But then this invention of YouTube came around and it seems that his big hits, the things that went big for him in the early days of YouTube, were any video that he produced where he was giving vent to a frustration that he had with what was going on in the state of the world or a company like the bike lanes issue. Uh, and so it was things of that nature. So if nothing else, it's not always doing something that you might love when you're talking about passion. You can be a Sith Lord about it and you could go on a, a tangent or a rant about things that you're wholly dissatisfied with and you use your aggressive feelings. <laughs> so yeah, so I, like, I, I would definitely say look at the things that are emotionally driven because you can connect to people on that emotional level and if you keep it fun and if you do it in a way that's interesting then it's not about competing. I know everyone's worried about saturation. It's like unique value is unique value. Like, you know, there are seven billion people on Earth, and a lot of times you pick a handful of them that you actually like. So I don't think you have to really worry about the market in that regard. I think that most of us, how many people here, let me ask you something. I'll ask you guys this. You guys tell me, how many of you subscribe to YouTubers because they just have a big following and a big subscriber count? Like, actual show of hands. Be honest. Okay, almost nobody. How many of you subscribe to a YouTuber because they made a video that you actually enjoyed? How many of you follow people on Twitter just because they have a million followers? How many of you follow people on Twitter because you actually agree with some of the things they're saying or their point of view, or you are curious about them? Hey, a better question, how many of you follow people on Twitter that you wholeheartedly disagree with just to see what crazy thing they're gonna say? Okay, so you see there's always there's always a way to approach this and to come at this that has very little to do with this idea that numbers breed numbers. There's an attention factor. I'm gonna talk about leveraging attention. But ultimately, what we all just determined about ourselves is that we are opting into things that make us feel something. Whether it's that we enjoy it, we like it, we agree with it, or we are angry or dissatisfied with it and we want to give vent to that, we all are making a practical choice about the content we consume. And as creators, I challenge you to be more empathetic and to think about the viewer. Think about what it is that they're tuning into you for. So do people seek you out for advice? Like a lot of people here seek out Chris's advice or mine. Are, are you there for somebody's personality? Are you there because you want to know what a, another opinion might be on something? Or are you there because this is like with Philip DeFranco where you are getting information and things that you didn't know about and getting introduced into something new that will open up your mind or will make you more aware? You have to figure out what it is that you like about the people that you're consuming and then ask yourself well, what will people come to me for what can i offer them what is my value so that helps you tell your story i am able to frame my story as a creative entrepreneur because i know what my mission is i know what i'm here to do i'm here to help other creators i'm here to help people like the members of my family who ended up having to suppress their art because it wasn't practical in the time that they grew up in. Today we have unlimited opportunity and so I don't want people to be starving artists. I don't want people to compromise on creating the value that they want to see in the world 
because I would rather help them figure out how to make their thing practical than talk them out of doing what they love. Okay, so that's my mission. And in doing that, I sought out things that would make me smarter about it, put me in a better position by actually doing them. That's why I produced a thousand videos. I produced a thousand videos. I went to daily content, not because I thought it would make me big in YouTube. I went to daily content because I would figure out how to streamline the editing process in Adobe Premiere Pro. I would figure out the uh, how to streamline the process of making videos in batch recording sessions. I would figure out things about the algorithm because I would have data. I had no idea that it would get me to a quarter million subscribers. I did it because I felt that the the most practical thing I could do is use myself as a guinea pig to figure out all the other problems that I want to solve for people who are attempting to do this thing. And so that for me is how I figured things out. That's how I acquired and came by the knowledge that I have. That's how I became YouTube certified is by actually executing on trying to figure out how to approach and solve a problem by pushing myself to a breaking point by putting myself through the ringer of producing daily content for like two and a half years. And the output of that meant, okay, in a four year period, I've done almost 1200 videos on YouTube alone. What it taught me was beyond YouTube and the organic growth, how to deploy in other social media platforms and how to use it not only for distribution, but to understand my audience better and how to create value for them, how to, I figured out the limitations of YouTube as a platform. I figured out that YouTube is not the best platform to communicate everything that I had inside of me. I figured out that there were things that's more practical to do on Facebook. I've recently really embraced Instagram because I think Instagram is the singular strongest platform for emotionally driven connection right now that we have. I think when it comes to emotionally driven connection and also speed of execution of producing meaningful content, I think that Instagram and being able to pull your phone out of your pocket and do Instagram stories, I think being able to pull your phone out of your pocket and capture a snapshot of what's going on with you in the world or even a selfie and then journal what you're thinking in this moment right where you are and be able to look back on that for yourself and that people who care about you are able to look back and see where you were, what you were thinking, what you were doing. I think that from an emotionally driven connection standpoint that Instagram might be the most powerful platform that there is because I think that you could interpret Instagram as a micro form of vlogging and I think you can consider Instagram of a publicly accessible journal and testament to your journey in the way that if you go back now and you read letters that George Washington wrote to his wife or you read the journals of any great writer out there, I think that right now the modern interpretation of that that's publicly accessible is Instagram as a platform. What would, you, um, what would be the difference between Instagram and Snapchat? Like the difference between Instagram and Snapchat, primary example of what I'm going to get into a context of platform, is that with Instagram, for one thing, you also have Instagram stories in a live streaming format, which means then you can have interaction versus just uh, broadcasting what you're doing or doing something creative. You can actually do the live video component, which then is a relationship builder between you and your audience, and you can save that for 24 hours as a replay. So the feature set of that is different. The features of Instagram and Snapchat are different. Snapchat, from a distribution standpoint, might be stronger for linking out because you don't need a follower account to enable the swipe up feature. So from a distribution standpoint, Snapchat could be more valuable, but Instagram has a larger active user base right now, and it also has more organic discovery than Snapchat. And Instagram, believe it or not, also does affect the Google algorithm in the sense that you can actually find content and images and things referenced in Google from Instagram. You can't do that with Snapchat. So in terms of that and in terms of archival, it's, uh, it doesn't have that. And then Instagram has its grid which means from an archival standpoint, you have the Instagram grid, and that also means that in Instagram with that grid, it's not limited to photos and videos. You can do written content in terms of expressing your thoughts or conveying a message versus where Snapchat, you have much more limitations there. And that's not to throw Snapchat under the bus because if you're a visual artist or a cartoonist, there are really great things you could do with Snapchat and really good hacks there. If you're an HTML video game maker or a mobile video game maker uh, experimenting, Snapchat could be fantastic for you for engagement and distribution. I find that Instagram has more discoverability, uh, a broader feature set, and a longer shelf life in terms of your content creation. And so that's where I think uh, the value is. And then demographics wise, from a monetization standpoint, I think there are more monetization opportunities in Instagram by far 
than Snapchat. And then I think leveraging the connection with Facebook is valuable as well. So again, that's a real life example of something I'll get into when I talk about context of platform is culture, quirks, and features, and then also um, what type of content is uh, practical to produce there. All of those things matter when you're deciding what platform to do what on. I came up with a robust communication strategy for the different value that I create across platforms. I actually encourage everybody here and anybody watching the replay, follow me on Instagram and watch and look at how different what I do in Instagram is than what I do in Twitter. Look at how different what I do in Instagram is than what I do in YouTube and watch how I specifically focus on Instagram itself instead of using Instagram as a funnel to grow my YouTube channel or even using YouTube as a crutch and using that to promote my Instagram. Look at how I actually make Instagram about Instagram and figure out what you can do there in terms of your own communication and content strategy. Every platform is unique and every intent behind how you as a consumer use a platform is also different. You don't go to Instagram for the same things you go to YouTube for. I really don't think you do. I don't think you have the same conversations in Facebook that you do in Twitter. And again, some of that is the feature set, the format, but a lot of it is the culture of the platform itself. So I think that that matters. Speaking of which, that's why creating content is about building a body of work that represents you. Where are you putting this content? How does it represent you? What is it out there to accomplish? That's what your personal brand really is when you think about it because your personal brand in the modern era is about your reputation, it's about your body of work, it's about storytelling, and it's about how people feel about you, and it's also about the network and the community that you want to be a part of and that you build. The context of how you relate to people in one group is not the context of how you relate to people in another group. Have you created content and enough to your background, to your story, that represents you as powerfully with this group of people as with this group of people. And that's something that is not said in the conversation around personal branding. It gets very much granular into marketing and deploying uh, tactics and which platforms and the debate as to whether you should even have one. And I don't think it's a debate. I think that you have a personal brand regardless of what you do because you have a story and you have a reputation regardless of what. And it's a matter of are you gonna paint a clear picture of who you are and are you gonna put in that work are you gonna wait for the other shoe to drop and for someone who doesn't like you to point paint the most unflattering picture of you they possibly can and you have nothing to contradict it? So I think if you're not dictating your narrative, you're waiting for other people to do that for you. I think there are a lot of people that are marginalized in the sense that the entire narrative of who they are has been painted by people who, are, who have never even bothered to get to know them or their struggle or get to know the community that they're a part of or their group. Anybody here ever felt like you belong to a group that's misunderstood in terms of maybe as a nerd or things you like or even as a content creator? And show hands. Anybody feel like people on the outside don't get what your group is because they never bothered to try and figure it out? I hear, you know what I've heard? I've seen TV reporters and I've seen people who have like a pit crew of 10 and 25 people to help them get their content out. Crap all over online content creators on Instagram, YouTube, Snapchatters, Viners, whatever. And I would challenge them, I'm like, take a week off and try making content for all social media platforms, try making YouTube videos, try doing Facebook Lives, try doing all that crap by yourself without a pick crew of 10 people to do your hair, makeup, and lights, write your script, do your editing, do your filming, set up a camera by yourself, figure out a DSLR, figure it out, and then get back to me and tell me how someone's doing this in their pajamas and doesn't have a real job or a real profession. Like real talk, real talk, real talk. I, like, you know, like this is called creator advocate. Cool. I'm going to stand up for creators on this. I'm, like real talk. You have people on the outside of something who don't understand the reality of it internally and have never bothered to try. So with that being said, are you going to wait for those people to paint a narrative about you or your community or your group? Or are you going to build a testament and a body of work that shows rather than tells exactly who you are, what you represent, what your values are, and what the reality of what you do is? That's why I value documentary filmmaking and I respect the hell out of those people. And it's why I also respect vloggers because when you can see the reality of something, and it paints a very clear and distinct picture of what that is, it really stands as a testament so that anybody can contradict 
people who are painting a false narrative to their advantage or because it's easy to marginalize or target that other group of people or to make fun of them or to um, ignore them or throw them under the bus because you have something to gain from that. And again, I'm not even going political on that. I'm literally just going back to high school on that. I'm literally just going back to high school on that because that's everything that somebody here has definitely experienced growing up at some point. So um, with that, I want to pivot to a very important point and I want to just make sure that, yep, I'm in the right order. Um, building credibility and authority uh, in your niche and what you do because the body of work is the testament to that. Your body of work is your credibility. More than like, I mean, my follower count in YouTube in my mind, I'm flattered by it and I like to think of it as number of people that I might have served at least once. And from a legacy standpoint, that's really flattering because I'd imagine that if I were a tenured professor, there's little chance that I touch a quarter of a million people in a meaningful way even once. Um, and I just realized the setup for so many horrible jokes in the current climate where that's concerned with what I just said. Um, so, um, you know, there is that. But again, the reality is that the technology we have and the platforms we have that we can deploy against give us this opportunity to scale and to reach more people in a fraction of the time that if you spent your whole lifetime, if you were blessed enough to have 100 years of health and strength and you used conventional means, I don't think you could reach the same number of people. That's the world we live in now where you can reach tens of thousands, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in a very short period of time and create value. And so. I feel more proud of the fact that I've shot, produced, edited, distributed, and marketed a thousand pieces of educational content by myself as a one-man band than I do about whatever my YouTube subscriber count is, whatever my Twitter following count is, whatever my Instagram count is. I feel more satisfied with seeing the number of results in terms of a body of work that I produced and seeing that number and seeing what daily execution looks like and seeing myself grow than I am seeing my audience number grow. That's what I would encourage more people to start to derive their sense of validation from is their body of work. Because at the end of the day, everything else is a byproduct of your body of work. If you actually don't show up and work, I mean, do you realize how many people I talk to who don't post anything in Instagram and will ask for people to follow them on Instagram? Do you realize how many people say, hey, I'm new to Twitter, follow me, when you haven't even given me context on whether I want to sit there and see you in my feed every day in the first place? Like, it's ridiculous and it's entitled to ask for somebody to give you something when you haven't provided any value or any context as to what they get out of it. I mean, that is insanity. But if you have a body of work that you feel aligns with what someone else wants, what value is for them, what is meaningful to them, you're not really asking for anything. You're giving them something and letting them make a determination about what relationship they want to have with you. And I think that that's an important differentiator. I think that that is very important in context as to when you create your own content, when you write an article, when you snap a photo, when you record a podcast, when you make a song, when you draw a picture, and people decide that they enjoyed it and they engage with it, they just said yes to you. Why do you care about anybody who said no? Why are you investing your thought process in the number of comparative people who said yes to someone who's not you versus appreciating the number of people who opted in and said yes to you because you may not even want a relationship with the people who said yes to PewDiePie or to this person or to that person because they may not be the community that you want. So why would you worry about that? And I know why. Because it's some kind of validation. It's social proof. I would encourage you to realign your thought of social proof from acknowledgement to execution and accomplishment to the work that you've actually done, and then to the people who align with what you've actually produced, because those people are the people who said yes, and the people who said yes to you, the people who are there for you, are the people who matter. There's seven billion people on the planet. 
there ain't no point in trying to please all of them. That's a nightmare. That's not even remotely interesting and that's not going to be about you being authentic and who you are. So I'd rather win on authenticity because authenticity isn't just a funnel for the people that you want to be with. It's a filter for the people that you don't want to be any part of at all. And I think that that's something to consider. So what I look at when it comes to building that authority is no like and trust factor. I don't know you. Put yourself in a position to be discovered and to be found. In the context of execution, a lot of that is thinking about platforms for search and discovery and engagement and what are you going to do in order to make yourself accessible. And in the real world, that means showing up at things like Creator Advocate, going to events, going to conferences, and then you can't just show up. You actually have to make people know who you are, put yourself forward, and then you have to think about what is it that is interesting or unique about me so that people can make a determination if they like that. And then, have I created enough value and have I shown up enough times for them to feel like they can trust me and have I put them in a position of that trust? Have I listened to them? Have I interacted with them? Have I been pleasant with them? Have I made the experience of interacting with me worthwhile and a good experience? That's how you build the know, like, and trust factor and it's important. The quality of your work. Create as constantly as you can. Create as much value as you can. And quality is both technical in nature, which we'll get into, but it's also about how you make people feel more than anything. Something can be technically perfect, but can feel soulless. And I think that's something that you have to really consider. They're like, you know what? There are, peop there are creators that have some of the like, most straightforward and maybe the lowest production values in the world that produce the best content in the world because they make us feel something and we relate to them and they're accessible. And then there are people who go out and spend $6,000 on camera gear and they make something that aesthetically is very pleasing and they have no personality or their personality is horrible. And so uh, I would just say that I'd probably rather be the former rather than the latter. And I think that that might be a sentiment shared by many people here. So again, you know, these are things, and by the way, this entire slide presentation will be available over in um, LinkedIn and later I'll put the video up. But um, all of this information will be available to you and I'm going to get it um, out if we're doing anything like an email or something like that because I want this to be accessible for you and for you guys to be able to get value from it, take whatever notes you want. So um, that also plays into a strategy that I'll tell you about later as far as getting, keeping your stuff accessible in as many formats as possible. But Again, I think that if you can either become a resource for people or you become very relatable or you're the person who shows up the most. Take it from Steve Urkel. A lot of guys came and went 20 years and you know, eventually he's the guy who stuck. So I think being consistent, I think there's magic that happens when you're consistent and I think sometimes being the person from a volume based standpoint who is just the most present is actually really important and sometimes that can mean again being where people want to engage with you meaning that it means maybe you're not just in one platform or another and maybe you're not presenting content in one format or another it might mean maybe not being everywhere but being where people want you to be or more importantly where people need you to be you know there I mean Twitter's not always a friendly place Reddit's not always a friendly place but there might be a real chance that what you have to offer is something that people who are going there have never had and might have a genuine need or desire for that nobody else is putting forward. So sometimes stepping outside of what we want and considering uh, the needs of others is not only very strategic and important, but from a, a truly empathetic standpoint, it's value. It's value and the thing is if we were on the receiving end, if we were in a place and we felt like for what we really want, we might as well be in the desert and someone shows up and gives us what we actually want or actually need, like we latch on to them for dear life. They're the oasis in the middle of this crucible that we've been experiencing the entire time and that's how you get a truly loyal following and that's how you, you know, build true community. Is that like a five minute countdown thing? Jesus, okay, we got real stuff that I have to get through so like I might have to go over a little bit on time. What do people say about you when you're not there? And what do you want them to say? Uh, real quick rant on the bottled water thing. Authenticity. 
Nobody is telling you when they say build a personal brand to be fake. No one's telling you to package yourself. No one's telling you to polish yourself in this way and that way. Most of the people who are gonna tell you that nonsense, that that's what, they're building a personal brand, don't be a Kardashian, don't be fake. Most of those people, you know what they have in common? 95% of them probably went to Harvard or Yale, probably have a pedigree that nobody in this room has, probably had advantages and access to resources that nobody in this room has. And then if you were to show up and you want to do a job interview with them, you would have to show up and you'd have to be fake. You'd have to show up in the business suit, the business skirt, whatever it is they want you to do instead of what you're comfortable in or what represents you. And you'd have to, when you show up to work, you'd have to tell them how great their ideas are when they're actually crap if you want to keep your job. That's what those people have in common when they're telling you about being fake. No one here telling you to build a personal brand and do content online is telling you to be fake. They're telling you, Go where you want to go, be who you want to be, do the thing that you want to do, do it strategically, monetize it so you have the freedom to be who you want to be on your own terms as much as possible. And that's the reality and that's the truth. So when people tell you don't be a personal brand, don't build a personal brand, you're not a brand, you're not a bar water, like don't be a Kardashian, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Because they're probably more fake than everybody in this room right now. Preach. Mm. So, you know, there's that rant. But what do you want people to say about you is important. And let's get into strategy real quick. Context of platform. I talked about culture. I talked about quirks. And I talked about investment of time. You know what one of the least investment of time platforms there is to create meaningful content? Snapchat, Twitter, and Instagram if you don't go overboard on uh, you know, putting together a $6,000 photo shoot for Instagram. Uh, like if you don't do that. Take your time. Sure. All right, awesome. So like, because this, this, like, these next five slides are super important. So I'm like, oh, I want to give them like two minutes a piece if nothing else. The, like, so investment of time, you can't be everywhere. And so many people say, oh, I can't be everywhere. Don't tell people to be everywhere. But here's the thing. They've never practically experimented or played that out. Just like I talked about like how the news reporter or something like that never probably tried to ever film and do things themselves or go to YouTube or go to Instagram and do it all themselves. A lot of people have never tested the theory of if I wanted to put out three meaningful posts on Instagram a day, how would I go about that? How much time would it do, take? Put myself on a stopwatch and actually audit that? I don't think a lot of people do that. People have not audited. If I wanted to go daily on Facebook Live for 15 to 20 minutes a day, what would the prep look like? What would the turnaround be like that for live? If I wanted to do YouTube live, could I do it? I don't think people are testing how long it actually takes to be in three to five platforms. And I also don't think that they figured out whether some platforms are, do I go there multiple times a day, like Twitter and Snapchat? Do I go there once a week, which might be YouTube, or a couple of times a week? daily if you're insane like me? Or do I like go daily multiple times a day in something like Instagram with Instagram stories? Or do I update to my grid a few times a day or once a day? I don't think people build a real communication or distribution strategy around their content and around their brand. And I also don't think people audit the investment of time. I think everyone is just easier to say, I don't have time, when the reality is you're not making it a priority. It's not that you don't have time is that this isn't a priority. And then you have to question why. Because what's the, you have to figure out, well, what's the ROI or what's the net gain or what do I want to accomplish and does the investment justify that? The other thing is a lot of people take for granted that the features of these platforms are different and you should use them differently. Again, I don't think you use Facebook the same way even as a consumer that you use YouTube. Even when you're consuming videos, they both are video platforms now, but I don't think you watch videos the same way in Facebook or discover videos the same way in Facebook as YouTube. That's a quirk of the feature set. And then in terms of what you want from Facebook, versus YouTube or Twitter, there's a cultural difference in the sense of in that period of time, you're in a different mindset. And as close as they are in features, and as close as they are in investment of time, the culture of Instagram is wildly different than the culture of Snapchat. And it's a different audience. Ultimately, one of the largest growing demographics in Instagram is um, women over 30 right now. That's not true for Snapchat. It's still Generation Z. Snapchat's losing millennials. Snapchat's losing millennials, gaining Generation Z, but Instagram has a firm hold on millennials and Generation X is growing in Instagram. 
Like, that's insane to think about the big difference in the culture gap there that we're talking about and the demographics and psychographics of how people use. So I encourage all of you to respect context of platform. You'll hear a lot of marketers throw out the phrase context of platform, but what they're not doing is breaking it down to at least these three things, which is culture, quirks and features, and the investment of time difference. It takes a wildly different amount of time to produce a YouTube video than it does to produce something for Instagram. It takes a wildly different um, amount of investment to go live on some platforms versus others and do it in a way that is meaningful or interesting or respects the expectations. Here's another cultural difference from a monetization standpoint. On Twitch and YouTube, you can directly get money from your audience in real time. You can't do that in Facebook Live. You can't do that in Instagram Live. Here's the other thing. If you go to Periscope and Twitter, or if you go to Facebook Live and you as a business model want to start doing direct selling on a product or service, the culture and demographic there will accept it. You go to YouTube and you try that QVC nonsense and you'll get crucified. <laughs> and we all know that's true because again, the expectation is very different. The culture is different. So again, that's what respecting context of platform looks like. It's about respecting the technology and the options and features, the way that people intend to consume there, and then respecting the difference of the investment of time or resources or energy that goes into it. Read, watch, listen, look. When you're making content across platforms, when you're building your personal brand, I'd encourage you, it might seem like a stretch, to consider read, watch, listen, look. Articles and ebooks still have discoverability in search as written content. Written content is not dead. Culturally, in context, older people tend to read more, but from a discoverability standpoint, Having articles and content and then embedding photos or video into them is a very practical way to get information out there. Amazon is not even being thought of by some people as a search engine, but it is. That's how we all find things aside from recommended, not unlike YouTube. You know, again, another benefit of machine learning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will not go into a rant on that. Um, I will not get on a rant on the demonetization aspect of that. I am like totally struggling in my live streams. Do you know any good platforms you would recommend I share it on? So in terms of distribution of, of live streams, of live streams, if you're looking at distribution of live streams, I would say Twitter and Facebook, but Facebook groups specifically that are geared around the topic of interest that you're covering. I'd also say that schedule your live streams and promote them in advance and get people uh, to tune in that way. Use a media company broadcast approach. We all know that like the flash comes on at eight o'clock on Tuesday without fail and they've marketed it well enough for us to know that and there's prep going into that and there's buzz in social media and it's in trending in Twitter by the time it goes live. It's not an accident, so I would reverse engineer that thought process. I usually do mine on Saturday, so Saturday's probably a bad day for it, huh? No, I would disagree. Saturday's the day that most people have to spend the most disposable time. What's a good time you'd recommend? It depends on the demographics of what the analytics say about where your audience is, because then you have to account for time zones. Just because you're in a time zone doesn't mean your audience is in that time zone. So I would say you'd have to look, there's no blanket answer. It's like saying, what's the best time to mm -hmm. upload on YouTube? And there's no real answer to that because it's predicated on your audience data, with one real exception. Monday through Thursday at some window between 4 and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is probably the best time to upload to YouTube. Why? Because um, at sometime between 5 and 6 p.m., Philip DeFranco is going to upload to YouTube. And that means a quarter, to a, a quarter million to a million active users are guaranteed to be on YouTube. It's the only predictability we really have with that, which means that if, if you don't have enough data yet, if I was a new YouTuber tomorrow and I was going to pick an upload schedule, I'd probably upload at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time Monday through Friday just because I know that the audience that tunes in for the Philip DeFranco show might be killing 30 minutes to an hour before the, video, the new video comes out. Because mm. I upload on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, so that's probably a bad day to upload. I don't think there's a such thing as a bad day to upload. Okay. YouTube has a global audience with over 1.6 billion active users consuming content. I think there's probably an audience at any given hour of the day, any day of the week for what you do. I think you just have to look at your data, tweak it, figure it out, and adjust. Um, a tool that might help you put that into context, uh, TubeBuddy. TubeBuddy like, is a good tool for that. Morning Fame is another one that also has some data on that. Um, VidIQ. VidIQ does, uh, Vidooly does. Like, um, 
um, and I also think um, Tubular Labs, there's like five tools that could probably answer that question based on data on your uh, content. And at some point in the near future, I have a 25 tools for YouTube, best 25 tools coming out. So just look forward to that, subscribe, <laughs> turn on notifications, all the YouTuber-y things, right? But let's get back to read, watch, listen real quick because super important. Um, search is still very much dependent on textual information in terms of the biggest search engine, Google, but also sources video content directly. It does not do audio yet. I really need Google to buy SoundCloud uh, for that reason because it's cheap and they're practically bankrupt. Sorry, SoundCloud. Um, <laughs> throwing you under the bus there. And we also know that uh, Google and all the search engines indexed photos and graphics. And we also know that these are also the basis of different ways that people learn and consume information. Visual spatial learners do better with photos, diagrams, and video. Auditory people who learn from lectures like watching YouTube videos to be educated, and they also like listening to podcasts. And then some people can only retain information through reading comprehension and also through list and uh, those type of articles. So I want you to think about that in your content strategy approach for your personal brand, that how can I get people to read? What will they read? What can I get people to watch? How can I get them to listen to something? How can I provide that? And what can I have for them to look at? And that's why, uh, again, you don't necessarily have to do all of these things. YouTube can be a hack because you can sit there and if you're shooting a YouTube video, you can probably get some decent still photos out of that same production. If it's information-based content, you, or if you do a, a live to tape YouTube live podcast, you could just strip out the audio and get a podcast out of that as an entertainer. And then you can, um, probably have somebody go through and make bullet points and get a list style article out of your content. And if you do long form content like me, you could probably have that repurposed and aggregated through multiple videos into a meaningful ebook if you want to, and then sell that in Amazon. So again, I think that video as a top down strategy to then produce other content is extraordinarily practical if you want to hit all of the different ways that people learn and people consume and that people are entertained. I, I think that this is very practical. Uh, in terms of types of content in YouTube, which you can apply, by the way, to almost every other platform if you really think about it, help, hub, and hero content. Uh, help you can think of as search-driven content. Hub you can think of as community-based, uh, emotionally interest-driven content. And then hero content, viral potential content that might be highly more polished or produced. I also think that some of these things are um, easier to do for one type of, or certain types of creators than others. Why is uh, hero viral? Because hero out of all these might have the most viral potential because it also means potentially getting on a tent pole or trending topic or something that might be newsworthy in nature, but also sometimes it could be driven by the production values or the way that it was done. A primary example would be if you jump out of an airplane in 360 with a Samsung 360 gear, hashtag not sponsored by Samsung, uh, not today anyway, um, then that might be something that can go viral. If you're someone like Jerry Rig Everything and a new iPhone comes out and you spend $1,200 on an iPhone, but then literally deconstruct it, take it apart, or do a drop test, that's something that is a big investment, but also is tentpole in nature and it's also ridiculously unique and has viral or newsworthy potential or massive share potential at scale. So hero is a harder thing to qualify because by the way, help or hub content could also be hero and help content can also be hub. So again, these things aren't all just standalone and you have to balance them. It can be lower production value if it takes advantage of either a press cycle or some other factor of virality that would go into a very different 40 minute conversation about quantifying and qualifying virality. Um, get somebody to hire me for that speaking engagement and I'll give you that. <laughs> so um, again, this is just a brief synopsis of types of content. Hub, Help, and Hero is a good thesis for every platform, for every platform. But also it's good in breaking up your overall content strategy because most of my YouTube channel is help content but most of my Instagram content is very community and very hub in the sense that it's where I'm being the most vulnerable and it's where I'm um, 
being much more exposed in the sense that I'm talking about my thoughts and my feelings about where I am in the world or what my journey as a creative entrepreneur looks like in a very different way. But that's also how I vlog. So it's a crossover of how I'm deploying that um, in these different things. But the way I use LinkedIn is clearly much more help and is much more search and is much more the professional mode. And then um, in terms of hero content, Hero content for me represents sometimes highly produced content that might be a collaboration with a brand or another creator. It may not even exist on my platform. So again, strategically con consider these things and break it out for yourself. Um, real quick, objective and subjective quality. This one is something I talk about in almost every speaking engagement because it matters. Technical production values are objective quality. Is your camera image quality good? Is everything in focus? Is the audio quality good? I recommend Adobe Audition for that. Um, is the editing quality good and cutting out unnecessary things that drag on too long? Again, that's what technical quality is. That's what objective quality is. Subjective quality might be more important. If you can make an emotional connection with the audience, if they're interested in what you're interested in, if once you got their attention, this is still relevant for them after watching for a minute or two, that matters. And then if you can trigger them to engage after they've watched something, that's the most valuable thing. You hitting this trifecta is more important than hitting the previous trifecta. If you have to choose between high production values and great emotionally satisfying content that is meaningful to the individual and makes them feel something and more importantly makes them do something, pick the latter, not the former. If you have to choose between doing something that is emotionally satisfying versus something technically objectively produced, go for emotionally satisfying because you're dealing with human beings, not machines. So I think that subjective quality is more important. Again, these slides will be, they're already up in LinkedIn. If you go to my LinkedIn profile and you go to SlideShare, it's already there for you guys. So I provided that because read, watch, listen, look. Generating content ideas. This is the thing most creators struggle with. Remember what I said earlier about knowing what you're good at, knowing what you understand better than anybody or what gets you excited or riled up? Do that and you will never struggle with what content do I create, what do I make today? Uh, you can answer frequently asked questions from your community if you have an audience or if you're part of a community meaning that you're a fan of Star Wars, you're a fan of technology, you're a fan of Game of Thrones, just go to the community and have conversations and then reverse engineer conversations into content. Look at your comments if you can't figure out what video to make. I guarantee you someone told you what video to make. I guarantee you someone in your audience has an opinion about what you should be doing. And you can take it or leave it. So there's that. You can crowdsource stuff directly from your audience in terms of information. You can even have your audience put together things and then you can share that as a compilation video. So you can crowdsource content. And then you could always document a process of some kind or you can sell a per share a personal experience. So many people, anyone in here a vlogger? Anyone he here feel the pressure of, oh, I'm not doing anything interesting today so it's hard to make a vlog? Okay, hack for you. Just tell a story about an interesting thing that you don't have any footage to show us and just emote on camera and walk us through. Because guess what? When we have coffee or dinner with you, you're usually gonna regale us with a story that we weren't there for, that we have no visuals for. And guess what you can do? Be energetic about it, make us relive it, paint a picture in our head, and if all else fails, talk with your hands like I do. <laughs> so again, content ideas. Uh, this is a huge primer on content strategy that I don't think we have a lot of time for. But uh, the biggest, but I'll talk to you guys about this later. And here's the thing, the slides are available and I've literally talked about content strategy at nauseum in other presentations that you can watch for free on YouTube uh, for like 40 minutes. But the big takeaway that I want everyone to take from this about what is, oh, I got one. Oh, so I got one, I haven't actually done this. Do you guys wanna know what the most powerful content strategy of 2018 will be in YouTube right now? Yes. And you generally across the board, probably even beyond YouTube and Facebook too, and in general, do you guys want to know? Your own branded mini-series or episodic content? Facebook is commissioning people to do shows, and I pay attention when big brands and big companies invest in that. Netflix has been doing original content forever, and now it's what they're becoming known for because everybody is clawing back the licensing and launching their own live stream platforms, which will spectacularly fail, and I will laugh when they do. Um, it's gonna be amazing, it's gonna be prolific. 
I'm gonna enjoy that so much. I'm gonna get to make a pun and a joke about so many brands, just like I make Blockbuster the butt of the joke in every single one of these presentations, which I just did. Um, so I think if you do your own branded series, even if it's a mini series that's five or 10 episodes of something, that that has staying power in YouTube and Facebook because when something is a complete series of five or 10 episodes, like a major TV movie miniseries or something like that, guess what it has in its favor? Packaging and replay value and branding, meaning that then you don't have the pressure to put out a new piece of content every week or every day or whatever because you have something that is binge worthy, that can get watch time, that can get views, that you can distribute in multiple platforms to get your name out there and to get the product out there to get the show. Because guess what? We'll watch The Flash on the CW. We'll watch Rain and Arrow on the CW. Or when it goes to Netflix, we'll watch it there too. Or or if someone freeboots it illegally to YouTube and you happen to be there, maybe you watch it. I don't know. Maybe you watch somebody's reaction video where they essentially stole that content. I don't know. But it means that you're not romanticizing the platform you watch something on. So from a branding standpoint, I would encourage a lot more of you to make a show. If you make a show, when the internet got started, you know what the big thing was? Web series. Watching web series. Anyone remember that? Is anyone like, or, or am I just super old? Like. Okay, web series are a thing. And so I would figure out how to make a web series as far as a contained narrative or documentary or whatever you want to do that's somewhere between three or five or 10 episodes. And then guess what, you can package it. One of the best examples of this on YouTube, um, The New Adventures of Peter and Wendy. Uh, anyone familiar with the Lizzie Bennet Diaries? Anyone familiar with School of Thrones? Like all of these great series on YouTube. So I, I, that's the biggest content strategy hack that I can give you for YouTube and beyond. And here's the beauty of it. If it's successful and good on YouTube, like video, high school, video game high school was for Freddie Wong, it doesn't mean that Netflix won't maybe look at you or Facebook won't look at you and make a non-exclusivity play. So guess what? Once you make a piece of branded intellectual property as a complete uh, beginning, middle, and end series product that you can sell, you can go direct to market and start selling it in iTunes, or you can get licensing deals with all these other platforms, or it stands as a body of work that might get you a gig that could change your life, or you might be able to convince brands, because that's the other hack, to start letting you make micro-produced series and content for them, for their platforms, and make a lot of money without even having to have something on your own platform and have a big subscriber count. You can make a crap ton of money, you could get a six-figure or seven-figure deal and have 10,000, 20,000 subscribers because you came up with a good idea that got you attention, just like um, Yulin Kuang did when she took the series I Ship It, which she did like three episodes of on her YouTube channel with like, what, 18,000 subscribers at the time? I think she's up to 25,000 now. And guess what she got? She got to do two seasons of a CW Digital Seed produced series and got to work with one of the biggest brands in cable and digital broadcast on a project that she first theorized on her YouTube channel a few years ago and only did like two or three episodes of. So don't think that you have to get a million subscribers to get a million dollar opportunity and to get millions of eyeballs watching your thing because I promise you it's not the answer. Uh, I'll do like Q&A definitely like at the end and I'm here all day so reach out to me there because I really quick like gotta like let the next speaker go. Um, <laughs> content that connects. Um, real quick hack for that. Reviews, reveals, and resources. If nothing else, this has been proven that if you um, can do these types of content regardless of platform, you can garner attention around them. I think that most people here have watched a review of a new phone one way or the other. Hopefully you watched uh, Chris's and I think some of his were the best, but I have a cognitive bias there. Um, and I, I think that revealing processes and industry insights, I think that that's part of my success is I've told people, well, what if you want to do, if you want to be a freelance creative and you want to side hustle or if you want to leave corporate America and start your own creative business, whether it's YouTube, graphic design, photography, what do you do? I'm revealing secrets. You know what? Five years ago, a lot of people literally came after me and told me I was insane and that I was going to go out of business. And they told me that I was a horrible garbage person because I'm telling people how to compete and that I'm stupid for for telling people how to literally take money out of my pockets. And I'm like, if they're good enough to beat me, mazel tov, because that's what meritocracy looks like. And if you're too soft, if you're too soft to compete because I'm giving away free information and telling someone how to beat you, that means you're not good enough. So like, I guess that's your answer why you're scared of me. And lo and behold, five years later, all anyone does is give away their secrets now. So it's really good to be historically correct.
<laughs> so again, mi mini rant there. Because, because it matters. It, it really does matter. I'm not like, look, I have people that I've mentored that are like went from the last two years from 1,000 subscribers on YouTube to like 750,000, 780,000, something like that. Uh, like my friend Geekdom uh, 101 is like almost at 400,000 now, where I'm sitting like you know at like a quarter million. It's like you think I really am that concerned that someone can take my same knowledge and information, reverse engineer it for themselves, and get to like 10 million subscribers? I'm gonna clap it up for them because it means that I was right more than anything. And that's what really matters to me, like, is that I was right. And so I think that if you reveal something, DIY channels, we watch that because it reveals a process. It's like, great, I can now assemble my IKEA furniture without looking like a moron and paying for something that I put together backwards. Uh, like, that's all I do, by the way, is I sit there and I just watch um, IKEA DIY videos and then and spend an absurd amount of money on furniture, but aesthetics, right? Like, thanks Apple for making me prioritize aesthetics. So again, and resources that no one else is providing. If you do something that other people are scared to do or other people don't have, then there may not be an example of something successful like Let's Play videos or something that people have gotten millions of views on. But guess what? If you do something you and new and unique and you take a risk and nobody else is doing it, what you might have found is an underserved audience that nobody thought to make something to care about because they didn't think there was enough in it for them. And guess what happens? You win because you showed up when no one else did. So I think that that ultimately matters. Final thoughts. Listen. Listen to your audience. Listen to the people who care about your content. Uh, learn to take constructive criticism, but also understand that not all criticism is constructed. constructive. Learn to have a filter. One of the last things I'm going to advocate for, one of the last rants here, is um, you might want to whip out your phones for this one. You might want to actually record this, like, uh, because this one is going to be a message from me to all of your haters. This is a message from me personally to all of your haters. So go ahead, you have my permission, whip out your smartphone, whip out your camera. This one is like, I'm gonna get it done for you. So here's who you don't listen to. Here is a message from me to all of your haters. Hey haters, how you doing? It's Roberto. So if you're here and you're watching this content creator, you're watching anybody who's put their real name and real face out there and built something in the light of day, and you want to hate on them or you want to troll on them from an egg in Twitter or a fake dark meme profile because you think that you're an edge lord, I got a message for you about what a loser you are because, and this is real talk, and I've never went on this rant before, is I'm gonna to talk to you about what a loser you are because here's the thing. They owe you a debt of thanks because you just wasted attention that you could have been spent building yourself up, monetizing, doing something meaningful, staying in the light of day, to be in the shadows like a coward trying to cut someone down who's doing something that you can't and that you don't have the guts to do and the courage to do because they are owning their thing with their real face and real name and when the checks start coming in and are written to them in their real name, you're gonna still be there trolling and hating instead of building something of value that is investable and if you got the time for that, then that really says something about you because you could easily be investing that time in yourself because I tell you what, I'm a pretty selfish dude on some level and I'd rather give that time to myself than somebody that's just going to delete me, just going to hit the spam button, just going to hit the block button. So while you waste your time and I teach them exactly how to filter all of your negative comments and all of your things in every platform so they don't have to deal with you, while you continue to speak into a void, they're going to keep building a community of people who actually care about what they do. They're going to create a body of work that represents them in the world. They're going to stand in the light of day and take all the good things that are coming to them and you're going to sit there stewing in the shadows hating because you don't have the courage and the guts to build something for your own self that you're proud enough to put your actual name on because if you actually were going to put your real name and your real face to this I could almost respect you and then at least you have guts but if you're gonna do it and you're gonna be a garbage person about how you communicate to them then I would say maybe you have guts but you could stand to gain a little bit of class so that's my message to you haters, and I feel really bad for you, but I have a message for you too. Go out there and create something awesome today. Create something that's worth putting your name on and actually owning, and then when you're head down hustling and doing real work and getting real value, you'll find you don't have time to hate on what other people are doing because you're focused on you and you're staying in your own freaking lane, building something real. 
instead of sitting there snarking and thinking that that's some kind of freaking accomplishment. So, no, this is expensive. I'm not dropping it. So anyway, um, content is about what you communicate. Content's about what you communicate, and we just went on a tangent very much that says that. And it's about your personality, it's about your overall goals and intentions, it's about finding common ground with people that you want to reach out to, it's about what you want to build that represents you, it's about legacy, it's about offering a discussion, it's about being accessible, it's about your unique value as an individual, and it's about what you want to stand as the testament to who you are and what you put out there. So really think about what your content and what you communicate says about you and also who it says it to and who it creates value for. Um, you can amplify your content by doing what I talked about with read, watch, listen and making yourself as accessible in as many forms of content and as many platforms as is practical. Yes, go where your audience is, but sometimes go where you don't know that your audience is or isn't and experiment and find out if there's an opportunity for disruption or new value, um, do that. Amplify your content through distribution in multiple platforms, but don't copy and paste and don't spam. Think about how you present the content differently. Engagement matters more than anything. I think today, engagement matters. I think being authentic, being engaged, being real, understanding that people gave you their time, they gave you their attention, and that they might have made some kind of investment or commitment to you, I think respecting that matters. And so I think being engaged with your community is really important. And I know it's hard sometimes, but I think that if you value the community, you'll find a way that works for you. And it doesn't mean always sitting there and taking selfies or autographs whenever someone rolls up to you. Like, you know, we were talking about that with like the Stranger Kids, uh, sorry, the Stranger Things kids and like, um, what goes on with that and the expectations. What I think is that you have to find the balance of how you are willing to engage with people and make sure that they understand upfront what your expectations are of interaction and just be real with people. Just be real with people. If you suffer from anxiety or if you're really shy, if you let people know that, most people who care about you will respect that and will do things on your terms instead of grafting their expectations onto you based on whatever they attribute to you just because you're out there. And they, you know, so at that point, if you make it clear what you want from people and what you want to do have in terms of the relationship, then you end up avoiding people just throwing you into a box and saying that you signed up for this. So I would say just be very clear about where you stand on things and what is and is not acceptable and what is and isn't okay in terms of engaging with you. What I tell people is keep my comment section clean. There are people who use this stuff as a resource. There's people who use this stuff at work. There's people who use this stuff at schools and I prefer to keep the content clean and I put the filters in place. And so people have learned to respect and honor the rules of what being in my community means. And I don't take it as censorship, but even if it was, I've never said I wasn't a dictator. I've always claimed to be Emperor Roberto. Dark Lord of the Sith. And I've always <laughs> said that I will try to be a benevolent dictator as long as you don't push me too far to the dark side. So I make the rules, I set the standard, I set the expectation, and most people respect that because they understand that I'm coming from a place of good intentions to create the most accessibility and value for everyone. So again, I would just say try to figure out what rules you want to set for people's engagement and then um, hold to that. I've got some resources here for you guys. Um, and again, short version is rev.com is great for closed captions. TubeBuddy is uh, great. Uh, go to tubebuddy.com slash awesome and use code Roberto's Buddy and they'll give you 20% off. Uh, hashtag not sponsored for this talk. Uh, TubeBuddy sponsored the other talks. Um, you know, Morning Fame is another great platform that I'm using. The Dually, VidIQ, uh, Tubular Labs, Adobe Stock, Graphic Stock, Audio Blocks. Um, if you're looking for mentoring, I have a group called Awesome Creator Academy that you can check out uh, at awesomecreatoracademy.com. And of course, my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash RobertoBlake2, just like the number two, at Roberto Blake and all social media. I am a living, breathing, walking resource for you guys and produce uh, what might be an absurd amount of content across all platforms on a regular basis. Take advantage of it, please. Uh, it's there for you. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm sure I'm over on time by five minutes times five. So um, thank you guys so much. Go out there, create something awesome. <laughs>